So we're coming to the last lecture on hashing and I want to talk mostly about a topic that relates to security. So the thing about a hash function is that it must be deterministic. You can't randomly assign an element to an array slot because then you can't find it later on. However, if the hash function is publicly known, then maybe some malicious user will keep submitting data which gives you a very, very bad runtime. For example, they could keep submitting strings that all hash to the same slot. Ideally, we could protect against this. You think about quicksort. If you have a publicly known deterministic way of finding the pivot, this allows for nasty input, which makes quicksort run in quadratic time. One way of avoiding that is just to randomly choose the pivot. Or another way, equivalently, randomly shuffle the input and then just choose the first element as the pivot every time. Then bad things may happen if you're unlucky, but no one can a priori know that they're going to force you to have a long run time. It doesn't matter what they put in, if you're going to scramble it anyway. So that kind of randomization is something we want to use for hashing. But as we just said, the hash function must operate in a deterministic manner. However, there's nothing stopping us from choosing the hash function itself randomly. So that's the idea we want to talk about now. So suppose we have a hash function, let's call it h. And suppose you're maliciously trying to create a collision. Remember that a collision is when you have x and y, which are different elements, which hash to the same place. That's a collision. Now, if you have full information about the hash function, then how hard is it to create a collision? Not very hard at all. Typically, it's very easy to create two things which hash to the same value, if you know what the hash function is. And I'm going to say the probability that you can create a co collision by choosing your x and y is 1. However, if you don't have full information, it gets interesting. Suppose you have no information about the hash function at all, so it's just, all you know is that it's a hash function and it maps into a table of size m for Mike, then what's the probability that you can create a co collision here? Well, you can't really do better than just guessing, right? You don't know where x is going to go. You don't know where y is going to go. So all you can get is a collision just by pure luck. And what's the probability that you get that? Well, x has to go somewhere, one of the m slots, and then y has probability 1 over m of hitting it. That's it. So the probability of getting a collision when you have no information is really small for a decent sized table, but it's still not zero. That's not going to cause us problems at all. We've seen analysis that shows that this works fine. This, however, is going to cause a lot of problems, and that's something we want to avoid. So the idea here that we're going to use is that we choose the hash function randomly from a set of possible hash functions. And that's going to reduce the probability way below here, and if we're lucky, we'll get it even down to here. Although today, I'm not going to show that. I'm going to show an example where we get down to not quite 1 over m, but actually 2 over m at worst, which is still very small for a large size table. So basically what we're going to do is this. We're going to have a set of hash functions, or family of hash functions. Okay finite,
And what we're going to do is choose the hash function randomly at runtime from this set. So the probability that we get any particular function out of here is just 1 over the size of the set. We're choosing them uniformly at random. Now, the malicious user doesn't know what we're choosing, so they have to pick their x and y beforehand, essentially. So we can imagine that they first pick their x and y. We then choose some h, hash function out of here. What is the probability that there's a collision? How can we express that? The event that there's a collision is that h of x is equal to h of y. Uh, but h could be any element of f. So what we need to do is, in fact, sum over all h's that have this property. In other words, we just count the number. So if we look at the set of all h which do collide for that given x and y, then look at its size. It's the number of h's that cause a collision, given that x and y. And then we multiply each by the probability that if we choose that h, which is 1 over the size, then this quantity here is actually the probability that we have a collision. And what we want is that this quantity here is quite small, ideally as small as this. If we can reduce this collision probability down to what it is in the no information case, that would be great. And that's called universal hashing. It's good to think about the analogy with quicksort here. With quicksort, we're looking at the probability that we get a bad runtime. We're trying to stop someone forcing the pivot to go, let's say, to the end of the list. If, for example, we choose randomly from every possible value with equal probability, then the user knows what they are, but it doesn't help them. The probability of worse behavior, or the n squared for quicksort, is always not zero. You could get super unlucky. But the user cannot make that happen. They can't make it happen with higher probability. So that's the idea here. Yeah. Bad things can happen, but the user can't force them to happen. In fact, they can't really substantially increase the probability of them happening. So what we want to do now is show an example that shows that this kind of thing is actually possible. Because at this stage, it looks quite ambitious. Now, for the purposes of what we're going to analyze today, we're just going to assume that we're hashing integers. We might be hashing other data types. Let's just assume we first convert them to some large integer in some unique way, and then we hash down to the small values. It makes it easier to do the analysis. So this is how we're going to do it. So m is the size of the table, m for Mike. That's given. I'm going to choose a number greater than or equal to that, and this number will be prime. So I choose it like that. Now, it's very important that this is prime, and we'll see why later, but not obvious at the moment. And then, I'm going to define my class of functions like this. It's the set of all functions. I'm going to call them h sub a, b. They're indexed by a and b. And a goes between 0 and p, but it's not equal to 0. And b can be equal to 0. And how are they defined? They're defined like this. h a b of x, get my integer, apply this function to it. What am I going to do? I'm going to do a times x plus b. Then I'm going to take it mod p. Okay, That reduces it down into the range 0 to p minus 1. The remainder. And that's still not in the right range to be in the table. I want an index into the table. 
So I will then take it mod m. Notice that the size of the set is just the number of distinct a's and b's we have. For different values of a and b, you definitely get different functions. And how many a, b's are there? There's a p minus 1 a's and p, b's, and they're independent. So it's p times p minus 1. And what we're going to try and show is that the probability of a collision is very small. In other words, your malicious user knows you're going to choose from here randomly. They have to pick an x and a y, which are different. Okay? What's the probability that they can make you have a collision? So a collision occurs if and only if ax plus b mod p mod m is equal to a y plus b mod p mod m and remember that x is not equal to y for a collision to occur. So two distinct elements that give the same function value. So let's look at the mod m part. These are integers here between 0 and p minus 1. And to say they have the same remainder modulo m is to say that their difference is divisible by m. Now, we can simplify here because we're doing a difference mod p. We can subtract first and then take it mod p. So it's basically a times x minus y. When you subtract this from here, the b goes away. And that's divisible by m. Now, modulo p, you can take the product modulo p, but we can also take the product first of each element and then multiply them. And in particular, a is between 0 and p minus 1, so it's already in the right range. x minus y might not be, because x and y can be anything, large integers. So what we know is that a times x minus y mod p, so that's an element which is between 0 and p minus 1, inclusive, uh, is divisible by m, and so it equals i times m for some integer i. Now, there are two cases. Case 1 is just the complete luck. It just turns out that the user chose x and y. Remember, they might know m, but they don't know p. They know this general idea, but they don't know the value of p. If they knew the value of p, they could easily pick an x and a y to force this to be 0. So x and y have the same remainder modulo p. And that would be bad, because they could always force a collision at this stage before you even take it mod m. So we don't tell them p, but we can tell them that we're going to use this scheme. So they could be really lucky, and they could just guess p somehow, or choose x and y, which happened to work out. Right? So we first have that case where x minus y is congruent to 0 mod p. And then we have the other case where it's not. Now, in the first case, since they don't know p, what's the chance that they can force a collision? They just have to choose x and y, essentially randomly. There are p different choices, modulo p, for the different values here. So once you've chosen x, the probability that y will have the same remainder mod p is just 1 over p. 
So the probability of this first case occurring if no information is given about p is just 1 over p. So in the second case, if x and y don't have the same remainder mod p, we have to now work out what's the chance of having a collision. So this is where we use the fact that p is a prime. We haven't used that yet. So we're going to use a basic fact, which is that if you have an element which is not 0 modulo a prime, then it has a multiplicative inverse. So the property of prime numbers we used is this. If p is a prime number, and say z is not congruent to 0 mod p, so it's not divisible by p, then z has an inverse. So there is some number, say, z primed, such that z, z primed is congruent to 1 mod p. You can look this up, if you like, in any basic number theory book. The easiest way to prove it, probably, is to use the Euclidean algorithm. Notice that if the number's not prime, this is not going to be true. So, for example, if a number was 12, and I pick the number 3, which is a divisor, that is not going to work. There's no way I can multiply 3 times anything and get it congruent to 1 mod 12, because this is divisible by 3. 12 is divisible by 3, but 1 is not divisible by 3. It's not possible. If, for example, we did it with 11, which is prime instead of 12, we'd have to find some number like that. Well, it's not immediately impossible. And in fact, you could take 3 times 15, right, is 45, which is congruent to 1 mod 11. So that's the basic reason why we needed to have a prime in order for that argument to work. So now we know that there's some element, say, t, for which x minus y times t is congruent to 1 mod p. Okay. What happens if we multiply this through by t? So t is an integer in the range 0 to p minus 1. So we get a is equal to i times m times t. Now x and y are given by your user. t then is uniquely determined because it's the inverse here. There's only one such element. And m is determined by the initial table size, so the only variable we have here is i. We don't know what that could be. There are only p minus 1 possible values that a could have anyway. How many can we actually get? We can't even get that many because this i times m is looking at multiples of m less than p, and there's only a reasonably small number of them. So the maximum we could possibly get number of distinct values of i, which satisfy this giving different values of a, is at most p minus 1 over m. This product can't be bigger than p minus 1, even if t is really small, like 1, can't be bigger than p minus 1, okay? So here, i times m is at most p minus 1, so that's as many values of i as you can have. Okay, i is not 0, remember? And so the number of HAB, which could cause a collision, which do cause a collision, is at most the number of A's I get times the number of B's I can have. B actually is not even needed here, so any B will work. So you get P times what I had over there. 
Now we're almost done with this case. That's the total number of things that cause a collision. I now just have to divide by the total number of h's, which is p times p minus 1, to get the probability that such an element causes a collision for a given x and y. Well, luckily I've got a p p minus 1 here and a p p minus 1 here. When I divide, they go away. And so the probability of a collision in this case, case 2 that we're in, is at most 1 over m. So putting all that together, there are only two cases, and we've done both of them. The probability of a collision is less than or equal to 1 over p plus 1 over m. p is bigger than m, so 1 over p is smaller than 1 over m. So the absolute most you could have would be 2 over m there. So it's relatively simple to come up with a family of hash functions which has nice protection against malicious users trying to cause collisions. With a bit more work we could come up with a more complicated example where we actually get a 1 over m, and that's like the case we have with quicksort, where there is actually no value given by the information that the user has about the implementation. But this is good enough for what we have here. Definitely you should try using this kind of idea if you've got any concerns at all about potentially non-random input to your hash function. So that's the end of our discussion of hashing. Now we're just going to have a review of what we've learned so far about the table implementations. So now that we've had a look at several different ways of implementing the table or dictionary abstract data type, we'll summarize the worst case performance in this table here. You can see that the worst case for the find operation is not so good, except if you have a balanced binary search tree or a sorted array. Similarly, there's real problems with insert and delete from any of these in the worst case. There's a similar table, but for the average case, where there's quite a bit of difference, there are fewer n's there, more log n's and, and lambdas. Lambda mean the load factor, remember, and if we can keep that under control, bounded, then really we're talking about order one behavior there. So if you're only looking at average case, you have more choices available there. So here we are again at the questions, and the first one concerns the Java programming language and a particular hash function which is built in. So you can look this up in the specifications of the language online. You'll see that when you hash a string, there's a particular way that you're supposed to do it by default. It has a particular formula given here. What I want you to do is try and find two small strings, each of two letters. You're allowed capital and lowercase letters. Find two of them which are different strings but hash to the same value. So there's a collision. Then I'd like you to think about why this could really cause difficulties in practice from a security point of view. Then we got three questions which are relatively straightforward based on the table we were just looking at before. There are various scenarios where the frequency of various operations in a table might be different. For example, you just may be in a situation where you have to look things up a lot in an existing database but there's very little change to the database. What do you do in that case in terms of your implementation choice? Is it better to use hashing, or binary search trees, etc.? This is the end of the initial course of lectures that I'm giving. I hope you've enjoyed them and found them informative. So keep enjoying your algorithms and get in touch with any useful feedback.